So let's talk about the Giants. Monday night game against the Green Bay Packers. December 11th, 2023, probably the best day of 2023 for me personally on a personal level, not as a father, but as a as a single person. And uh, I had some good feelings about this game going into it. And I think a lot of other Giants fans did too, even despite the fact that we typically stink after a bye week. Our record after the bye week is atrocious. Our record in prime time is atrocious, especially on Monday Night Football. All signs, all prior history was pointing to the fact that we're probably going to lose this game. The Packers are like, we're 18 and 0 in December uh, under uh, head coach Matt LaFleur. The Giants ended a lot of streaks on Monday night. They ended a nine game losing streak in home night games and won a primetime game in MetLife for the first time in seven years. Last victory. It was December 11th, 2016. I don't think I was at the game. Was I at the game? I think I might have been at the game. Against Dallas, that was when uh, Janoris Jenkins came up with that big pass deflection guarding uh, Des Bryant. Dak Prescott was a rookie, and that's what gave us the division crown was in that game. So uh, seven years to the day. Wow. Uh, we're now one in four in primetime games this season. And uh, we had been 1-16 in in our previous 17 regular season night games. Mm. I mean, everyone was asking for this this game and the Eagles game on um, Christmas night to get flexed out. Like, please, we've been through enough. And we showed up and we showed out, you know. When I had put out the preview for the Packers game last week, uh, they had not, Dable had not announced yet that uh, Tommy DeVito was going to be the starter. And I had pushed for Tyrod Taylor to start because I thought he's a veteran. He, uh, I just felt like he was the better choice. You know, he's the vet. And I don't know, you know, after seeing what Tommy did against the commanders and the Patriots, that that's enough. But I don't think I gave the Patriots enough credit, Patriots defense enough credit. And if you look at uh, Tommy's numbers, over the past four games, he's he's improved every single game. And the really the biggest knock on him was he takes too many sacks, right? He go, he takes deep shots and he takes risks and he likes to th push the ball down the field, which is awesome. But he also holds on to the ball too long and he misses checkdowns or people that are underneath or he tries to scramble when he can't. There's no uh, lane or avenue or, or what have you. So... Um, and he's improved and now that's not an issue anymore. I mean, it's, it's still a minor issue. I mean, you know, he had 81, he completed 81% of his passes on Monday night. Um, 158 yards, a touchdown, no interceptions and a passer rating of 113.9. So his third game with a rating higher than hundred, he's not throwing a pick in his last 87 passes. That fucking touchdown he threw to Isaiah Hodgins is next level. Very few quarterbacks in the league can do that. I'll say it right now. I don't think Daniel Jones could have made that throw. And I don't think Tyrod Taylor makes that throw, at least this season. They have not shown that they can make those throws this season. At least Daniel Jones. Tyrod Taylor, he's had a couple nice throws, uh, I think, in the Buffalo game. And, you know, just taking deep shots to high it and whatnot. So less confidence in Daniel Jones, which is, uh, it's just weird how that, the, the order has been reversed. Like Daniel Jones is the starter, Tyrod the backup, DeBito the emergency starter, third quarterback. And now we've completely, it's completely flipped on its head <laughs> where it's like, we're, I, I didn't believe in the guy. I wanted Tyrod to start. I thought this was a, a not a sham or a hoax, but I was like, this is a nice little story, but it's not, you know, it, they're going to figure him out, you know, and I couldn't have been wrong, more wrong. Dude was four for four for 53 yards on the game winning drive. Looked cool as a goddamn cucumber. Uh, I, I'll say it kind of like Tom Brady in the Super Bowl against the Rams. I think the biggest difference maker was uh, he carried the ball 10 times for 71 yards. So some of those runs carries were designed, right? Uh, run option. Some of them were just, you drop back, you take a look at your first and second read, it's not there, there's a hole, and you take it. And for whatever reason, Green Bay did not put a spy on him, which was a huge mistake, and he they got gashed several times because of that. I think if you take away those 71 yards, and they have a spy on him, um, 
the game turns out a lot different. So, like I said, he wasn't sacked at all, which is a rarity, you know. Um, in our previous four games, Giants quarterbacks have been sacked 28 times, the highest four-game total in franchise history. Um, and only two quarterback hits. So even though uh, he did experience pressure, he, they, they kept him clean. They kept him upright, and that's the, that was uh, a huge factor, you know? And I, I think we have a pretty good thing going on that offensive line, you know? Uh, I think a, a lot of people would agree that probably half of the sacks that DeVito was taking was because he's just holding on to the ball too long. He's got to learn how to throw it away, um, you know, or uh, find, check it down, drop it off. Um, so I think they're coming around. You know, I had I had my doubts about Andrew Thomas. Like, is he going to hold up? He's got that sprained MCL, torn ACL, and although they had a bye week and they were able to rest up him and Dexter Lawrence, there were still question marks surrounding them. Is Bobby O'Karake gonna hold up? He's got a he's dinged up with all hell. So, but that offensive line, Andrew Thomas, Justin Pugh, John Michael Schmitz, Ben Bredersen, and Tyree Phillips. They're I think that's your five right now. And I don't think you you deviate from that. You know, when a, when Evan Neal gets healthy, do you even put him back at right tackle? I know Tyree Phillips had a, a bad false start. I don't know if he was called for a holding. I'd have to, you know, I haven't looked at his PFF grade or any of that nonsense. I haven't looked at the tape, but by all accounts, I mean, like the eye test says that he wasn't too badly beaten and he's not too much of a liability. And if anything, he's playing at the same level or maybe a little bit better than Evan Neal. So I don't need, I don't know that you need to rush Evan Neal back and I don't see them rushing him back, you know? I think it's if it's Andrew Thomas level play player, maybe they they're trying to push him a little bit more to get him back in the lineup. But it's Evan Neal, and he's just uh, he's struggling. So there's a telling quote from Brian Dable on uh, Tommy DeBito. He said his uh, Tommy's objective is to take care of the ball and lead the team down to score points regardless of the quarter and play your best when it counts the most. The only way you do that is through your pep preparation, your hard work, and again. I think uh, Shea, the quarterbacks coach, and Mike Kafka, the OC, do a really good job of developing quarterbacks. So Dable's doing a little bit of a damage control there, right? Because there was, I mean, that was all, the the entire news storm around the Giants locker room, other than Tommy DeVito, was the fact that uh, Dable has a rift, a feud with uh, Wink Martindale, and that all three coordinators, special teams, offense, and defense, could be gone at the end of the season. I a lot can happen. I mean, it, literally, it's a freaking roller coaster week to week in the NFL, like where you're like, oh, this team's going all the way. This team is trash. This team is, you know, the powerhouse. This team is a fraud. So, I, you know, who's to say what's going to happen in another month? Um, but I think f most Giants fans are, are like, get rid of the special teams coordinator for sure. Keep your defensive coordinator because Wink Martindale did a hell of a job against this Packer squad. And I don't know that you can really part with Kafka just yet. I don't think I would be too downtrodden if they did move on from him, you know, if he does get a job somewhere else. But at the same time, it's like he, this is the, and I know this is going to sound ridiculous, but if you think about the offenses that we've had and the creativity level and the scheming and the concepts and the designs, Kafka's has been the best, better than what we had with Judge by leaps and bounds, and some would say better than Shermer, and probably even McAdoo, which is crazy. Uh, McAdoo is a head coach, because I think everyone was lauding McAdoo when he was the OC, not really fully grasping that, well, oh, it's Eli and OBJ. That's really the offense there. So uh, I don't want to lose that. And to, to have these quarterbacks go through another goddamn coordinator, ooh, I don't know. But it is Dable's offense, right? I think so. Maybe Dable decides he wants to he wants to take more more of that over, or bring in one of his guys that he prefers. We'll see. But we're three or four in the red zone. Very uncharacteristic of this Giants offense, and a sign of good things to come. That's a sign that this offense has turned a corner, and uh, maybe has gotten, like I said last week, all the bad juju out of their system. Like all the injuries are out of our system. All the bad performance, the mistakes, the hiccups, the whatever. We've we've uh, digested that. It's in a nicely, tightly packed coil on the sidewalk.
You're welcome. Pick it up. We, but we, uh, yeah. So the red zone success is great, you know, and I think that's what ultimately is going to win, you know, win us games. And it's why we lost a lot of games in the first half of the season, at least the ones that were close. You know, you talk about uh, the Bills game, the Jets game. You punch it in more than once in that game, you win. You know, too many times that we settle for field goals, you know? So, uh, you know, that's uh, that's huge. Uh, on third downs, not so great. We converted only three of our thir- 10 third downs. But I think it was, you know, and a lot of people have mentioned this already, we were not a lot, ton of third and long, quote unquote, situations, meaning more than 10 yards. You know, everything seemed manageable. It was like every third down we were in was third and five, third and three, third and one. You know, it was, uh, it was, it felt attainable. It felt like we weren't going to have to uh, surrender, you know. Um, you know, the fourth down, there was there two fourth down plays, one fourth down play. Here's what I don't understand about fourth down plays, and which is, it seems to be a debate that has raged on for way too long. Whenever it's fourth and short, everyone says, if we don't go to Saquon, they go, you have the best player in the league, one of the best running backs in the league in your backfield, and you're not going to give it to him, your best playmaker on fourth and one when you only need one yard. And I'm thinking, if you're thinking that, the opposing defense is for sure thinking that. And so they're going to stack the box and they're going to go for him. To me, the play that makes the most sense all the time is play action. Heavy set, play action, um, and a boot. And you're going to have a guy, you're going to have a guy open nine times out of 10 for sure. So uh, that's the call I would go with either heavy set, play action, boot, or you spread it out. And I know people don't like to see uh, a shotgun formation in that situation to give up all those yards to gain one. So I'd say, Spread formation quarterback under center, or even uh, spread formation wildcat, which they did run the wildcat a couple of times. The one time uh, Saquon barely handed it off to Wandale, I guess he wanted to keep the ball on that one exchange. And Wandale takes it for 32 yards, which I thought was uh, incredible. Uh, Barkley had 86 yards and 20 carries. People were acting like he didn't do shit in this game. I don't know what you were watching, you know. Um, 15 receiving yards and three catches. Became the fifth player in Giants history to rush for 5,000 yards. Uh, Brandon Jacobs is fourth. John Morris is third. Barkley now has two more than 2,000 receiving yards to become the fourth Giant with 5,000 rushing yards and 2,000 receiving yards, joining Tiki Barber, Alex Webster, and Frank Gifford. Uh, for reference, like, you know, you take out Tiki and, like, it has, that's not happened in a long, long time. And Tiki retired in 06, so it's been 17 years since someone has done that. So, uh, you know, I know people are pissed we draft him at two. I know they're pissed that we franchise tag him. I know they're pissed that we're we're probably going to sign him and make him a giant for life. I'm not. I will back that decision to draft him. I will back the decision to re-sign him, even if it puts a it it you know it limits our our abilities you know with the salary cap and the space there. I'm I'm willing to do that because this is a generational player. You're probably not going to get a guy like this for another 20 years, 15 years, 20 years. So yeah, I say resign him, give him what he wants, and we'll figure the rest out. If the Saints can be $80 million over the salary cap every fucking year and make it under, we can do it. If the Eagles can massage the piss out of the salary cap Every single, how are they signing Shaquille Leonard, the, the, the linebacker from the Colts who got waived, who's like an all pro pro bowler. What the fuck? So if they can do it, like, let's figure it out. Let's just like, you know, let's snipe some of their talent, swipe some of their talent and makes and, and give Barkley what he wants. And, uh, you know, anyway. Saquon's the ninth player in franchise history with 7,000 total yards. Ahmad Bradshaw is just ahead of him. And uh, it looks like he should be able to surpass uh, number 44 by the end of the season. With 101 scrimmage yards, Barkley reached the century mark for the 35th time in his career in the regular season and the second highest total in franchise history. You know, and that's what separates him from, you know, people say you don't draft a running back at two. It's like, no, well, you don't draft a running back at two. But when when you can draft a multi-purpose back who is a threat 
out of the backfield catching the ball and receiving, yeah, you can take him that high and you can pay him that much. The two rushing touchdowns increased Barkley's total of, career total of 32, tying him with Ahmad Bradshaw for ninth on the list. Um, you know, I think uh, it, was, it was a scary moment. I think it was in the first half where he got tackled. The guy slammed him to the turf and he bounced his head off the, the turf. And then, so he, I think he went into a, con, a concussion protocol evaluation. You know, this comes after Sunday when the Jets uh, put a, the smackdown on the Texans. And they slammed C.J. Stroud to the turf, and he hit his head hard, and he went he went to concussion protocol, had to leave the game. So I was worried about that, and I don't know if there were lasting effects, but there were a couple uh, short yardage situations, like a couple fourth and ones, where it's like, why you you don't if you're if you're going first of all, I hate that on fourth and one, we can't go straight up the goddamn gut and make a push and get three feet. It is it sucks. That we feel the need to sh- do these stretch plays off tackle, outside the tackle. I just, I, I don't agree with it. So I don't agree with the play call. At the same time, he had blockers in front of him. And if he just is patient, maybe instead of just kind of running into people and falling to the ground, maybe he can, you know, uh, get some momentum and I don't know. Steamroll some punks. <laughs> And uh, so there was that, there was kind of like the, I, I don't want to say lack of vision, because I don't know that he really had, they, they they were not good about showing the all 22 behind the offensive line, you know, looking down the field uh, horizontally, vertically, I don't know. They weren't good about showing that. And it would be nice to have like a sky cam or something just to see like, okay, is there a hole there? Or was he really had no options or was, is it just like a matter of being a little more patient and then bursting? Um, and really the big one was uh, the 33 yard carry where he stumbles, he falls and fumbles, the, fumbles the ball and the Packers return 50 yards with, uh, you know, less than two minutes on the clock or like with two minutes le- left in the game. And it's just like, <sighs> fuck. Pretty much everything leading up to that juncture made me think we're going to win this game. I was like, our defense is coming up big. Jordan Love is a bit off. You know, he's not hitting his targets like he usually does or has been over the past three, four games. And it just feels, it just feels like we have this game. Like we have the momentum. We have the juju. You know, we've got, we've got uh, Tommy Cutlets and DeVito Fever. By the way, people trying to force DeVito sanity on us. You got to stop. Lynn Sanity made sense because he's got in his name and his sanity begins with in. Lynn Sanity really rolls out the tongue. DeVito Sanity just does, no, no. DeVito Fever. DeVito Fever. Very easy to say. And that's what you got to say. So I, I've, I've uh, come down full-blown DeVito Fever. Um, but uh, yeah, I, that it's just, he never fumbles the ball, so I I don't want to come down hard on Barkley. For that play, it was very reminiscent of when Eli Manning uh, tried to tried to. It was like waning moments of the game. I think we were in our own territory, but we're kind of putting together a drive. It's slow, but it looks like we could maybe make an effort and make it close or uh, whatever. And he scrambles and runs and he just stumbles and falls and falls to the ground. And when he falls to the ground, he loses the ball. And I think it was even a similar situation as this where he might have been tripped up. Like he initially was tripped up, but didn't immediately go down. But, you know, it definitely affected his uh, equilibrium or balance or something because he eventually would then fall. And I think the same thing happened with Saquon where like if you look, it's replay, guy gets his ankle and trips him up like you know is able to get a get him uh stumbling and he almost goes down but Saquon's so goddamn strong that he's able to stay upright but it, it's he's, you're still he still wasn't back to normal he was still thrown off and that's when he he trips and stumbles again and uh, the ball comes out so you know I, I, it's it's hard to argue against it it's just such a ugh, what an awful way to lose the game you know, and I, I said, I said to, uh, cause I was FaceTime my mom, my mom at the time. I was like, um, 
game over. You know, the, the, that just happened. We're, we're losing this game because you can only ask so much of this defense. It, it, it probably is, you know, the, the, what a goddamn momentum shift. Like all the momentum is on Green Bay's side when it looked like it was, I mean, that was, the game was pretty much over. If he holds on to the ball there, he's inbounds. Green Bay has to take a timeout. Um, they only had the, you know, they had, they would run out of timeouts. If they do get the ball back, we would probably kick a field goal there. And then, uh, you know, it's 21 16. We kick a field goal, although, you know, Randy Bullock, hmm kick a field goal 24-16 and they would have like a minute or less and they had to go down the field and score a touchdown and get the two-point conversion. I feel a lot better about our odds there. So I could just tell, and a lot of the plays leading up to that touchdown, I mean, there were so many, so many instant replays and reviews in this game. It was just like everything. I mean, the Wandale Robinson catch uh, on the sideline was, uh, was incredible. One of the best catches I've seen a giant make ever. I think it's safe to say I've never seen a Giants receiver make a catch like that before. Like that, no. Um, but, you know, it was like Love throws to the uh, right side of the end zone. I think it was to Wicks or someone, and he gets only one foot in. Adore Jackson just pushes him out of bounds. You know, there's another uh, play where, you know, I mean, it was just so many close calls. So many close calls in the game. Uh, in that last Packers drive that I was like, there's no way they don't score here. I mean, they're coming way too close and sure enough, they get the the touchdown uh, on Banks. You know, Banks uh, had pretty close tight coverage, but I'd like to see him get his arm up or his hand up on that one. And even that one was close. It was like it, he barely got in. So uh, speaking of Juan Dale, he had a career high 115 scrimmage yards, uh, six catches for 79 yards. And of course that, Two carries for 36 yards. Um, so Wandale came to play, and that's the kind of uh, effort we'd like to see. And I, I hope that we can continue to see moving forward. You know, Darius Slayton had a bit of an off night, only two catches for 14 yards, I think. Um, but Isaiah Hodgins, that's, I mean, like, when one guy's down, like Slayton might be down right now due to injury or what have you, another guy has to step up. Paris Kimball was a scratch. Uh, I think for his knee. So now you're down to, you know, um, Wandale and Isaiah and Darius. And Isaiah uh, is still a threat. You know, I know that he has not played up to the level that he did last year, but he's a big body and uh, could is essential read in the red zone. Like the fact that we're not trying to get the, him the ball more in the red zone is has been perplexing. And they're doing it now, and he has two touchdowns in two games. So let's continue. Continue, please. Uh, the defense is really the, I mean, DeVito, well, we'll get the Randy Bullock, but, you know, it's, it was the DeVito and the DB. The DeVito and the defense, really, right? DeVito having just cold-blooded, silent, uh, absolute assassin, uh, you know, not letting the moment phase him and just staying, staying so goddamn cool. And uh, glad to have him, man. He's making the season a lot more interesting. And, you know, there's talk about someone saying he should be the starter going into the next season, which might be the case because if Daniel Jones doesn't come back in time, then, yeah, you got to go with uh, DeVito because at this point, do you even go quarterback in the draft? You know what I mean? Like, I think we're, we have the five, we had the four or fifth pick, and now with our win, We've, we're now bumped back a few spots now. So it's like, are you going to get your guy, the, your guy? I mean, look at Jake Browning. Jake Browning is a perfect example of a guy that was drafted and like, what round was he in? He was definitely not a first rounder out of Washington. I mean, people wrote off the Bengals so goddamn hard when Joe Burrow went down and, and Jake Browning had to come in. Um, what round, dude? Give me the round. <laughs> Oof. Skews. Nope, this doesn't say. Hmm. Was he not drafted? Whoa. That can't be right. No way, dude. When was Jake Browning drafted? Oh, shit. He didn't get drafted? Whoa. Really? For real? He was not drafted? 
I miss that. Well, I mean, you know, Tommy DeVito not drafted. So all these goddamn people on, t- on Twitter that every day talk about how the Giants are not going to be able to get Drake May and Caleb Williams and blah, 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 blah. It's like, shut up, dude. Shut up. Quarterbacks are allowed to have down years. And Tommy DeVito is just like an excellent example of a guy that like wasn't drafted, but just works his dick off, studies hard and talks with the, you know, the coaches and, you know, it's, it's just, I don't know. So I, I, I'm fine with not getting a top quarterback in this class and if and yeah, if that comes back to bite me i'll live with it okay but the defense is uh the unit that really stepped up big time uh they surrendered only 326 yards of total offense that's from a packers team that was averaging something like almost 400 yards of total offense a game over the past few games defense also forced two turnovers we got the jason pinnock interception which I know uh, Matt LaFleur LaFleur was losing his mind on the sideline, wanted a uh, defensive holding called because I don't think he could have called pass interference on that because the ball was so far underthrown. Um, I think it was on Cordell Flott. Cordell Flott had an awful game, and it actually got benched in favor of Darnie Holmes. So that's a bit discouraging. I feel like he was pretty much the only guy that was underperforming on the defensive side of the ball. Everyone else really came to play. Um, on the interception, we got a great pressure from Xavier McKinney. I thought he got a piece of the ball, but I think he did at least affect the quarterback. Like I think Jordan Love was definitely affected, maybe caught him in the corner of his eye as he's trying to make that throw. Uh, we got the strip fumble by Kayvon. I mean, I, can, I don't know if I can apologize enough about ever thinking, remotely considering that Kayvon Thibodeau is a bust. Apologies, you know? My sincerest apologies. Like, this guy is an absolute beast, a stud to the max. He's got uh, how many sacks on the year so far? 12 or more? And making big plays in big moments. You know, I think uh, I criticized him early on because he was getting sacks that were like coverage sacks that was like, eh. You know, or we're in a blowout and you get one in garbage time. It's like, eh. Now he's making impact plays like he was making towards the end of last season, you know, especially against that in that commanders game. Um, So we now the Giants defense now has seven different games with multiple takeaways and have totaled 22 turnovers on the year, which is tied for fifth most in the NFL and just too shy of the league lead. Whoa, dude. I mean, if if they can continue at that clip, it's kind of hard to see us lose, (laughs) which is. Uh, crazy because we've definitely had games where we we've gotten like four turnovers or three plus turnovers and lost big time i think it was against the dolphins and the cowboys so uh not sure why i said that but i think with the offense clicking like it is now i like our chances a lot more opponents are converting just 35 percent of their third down attempts against the giants which is the fourth best mark in the league awesome you get off the field i think that was a huge issue in a, in a bunch of the games that we got blown out where it's like we are forcing these great offenses into third and longs, and then we're just letting them convert. What the fuck? The defense's average drive time of two minutes and 35 seconds allowed is the fifth lowest. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think they're hitting their stride big time. And, uh, you know, I, I think we still do miss Leonard Williams, but I do think Ashawn Robinson and Nacho have stepped up a considerable amount. You know, you have Jihad Ward filling filling gaps. Bobby O'Karake is playing at an all pro level. Aziz Ojolari got a half sack, which is good to see. Um, I know Thibodeau got a, a half sack with Mike McFadden. You know, um, it's just like I said in, in one of the videos last week, <sighs> from week to week, you don't know what you're getting with this defense. I mean, I think a lot of people felt good about our chances against Green Bay, even even with them coming in so hot. But then you you have games like you did against Dallas and you have games like you did against Miami where it's just like they just completely like we I mean, not every drive was a great success. Right. Um, we did hold them to 22 points, but we we like gave them three points at the end of the first half, which I did not like. I was like, what was happening? We're not playing like we uh, have been for most of the game so far. Um we did limit to Green Bay to just five conversions on 14 third down attempts, which is a little less than 36%. 
they usually convert over 43% of their third downs, which is sixth best in the league. So, you know, and like I said, Jordan Love was missing open throws. And I know I've been like in love with Tommy DeVito and singing his praises, but there were a couple of open, open receivers. He had a uh, Wandale Rope Robinson open for a first down or a big gain. He had Saquon Barkley open for a first down. He missed it. So he is, he missed, I mean, he didn't miss many. I mean, 81% completion is uh, pretty legit. And um, so he didn't miss many, but the ones he did miss, it was not, they weren't throwaways or like passes defended. It was like, these guys are open. Got to hit them. Even on some of the scrambles where he did pick up really good yardage. If you, if you look, I mean, I, I felt like I saw the same play over and over where he drops back and he doesn't have, he doesn't feel like he has the time to hit Jalen Hyatt on the deep crosser. Cause he, it was, it felt like there were two big runs that he had where Jalen Hyatt is just about to, he's behind, he's in between the safeties that are dropping back on the deep uh, pattern probably Slayton and he's beyond the linebackers and he's just about to get past that slot. I think it's the slot guy or the cover four corner cover three corner on the other side. But if DeVito just takes a moment sets and, you know, leads him to the sideline. I mean, that's, those are big gains. So hopefully he picks that up in the film study. Uh, I mean, he's getting better every week. So, um, you know, you can only ask so much. The guy's undrafted. It's his fourth start. I, you know, it's just incredible. So um, Deontay Banks led the team with 12 tackles, nine solo. Uh, he did break up a pass intended for Samori Turi in the end zone on a third and 10 from the Giants 30 late in the fourth quarter. That would have uh, that would have been bad. That's for sure. Um, you know, so that that was a huge, huge play. And that's been uh, that's part of the scouting report on Banks, right? That has been since his time at Maryland is like, he uh even when he does get beat, he makes up the ground and he breaks up the pass. So he rarely gets beat deep. Although I do wonder if Jordan Love were more accurate, or if you're looking at a Brock Purdy or Dak Prescott, I can't believe I just said that. But a more t- top echelon quarterback, they probably would have put it in a better spot, better ball location, and uh Banks would not be able to defend it. But you know, sometimes the ball bounces your way. The uh, Packers had to settle for a field goal there. They also had to settle for a field goal after that uh, Aziz Ajilari, Dexter Lawrence had a sack parade and uh, missed it from 45 yards. So that was huge. Uh, and um, Packers were two of five in the red zone. So you win the red zone battle, you win the game usually, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's basically how that goes, unless you're just a big play factory. Um so uh i don't know i mean you know i just it does suck that it feels like they do take off a drive or two even in the games where they're like the the jets game it was like what happened on that last goddamn drive in the in the regulation what happened gah like you're playing lights out the entire game and then you just it's just like one drive they just they just like it's like the controller <laughs> The controller got unplugged. We're disconnected. Jesus, Neil. Welcome to the 2020s. Ah, so defense came to play. And then special teams. Um, you know, we, Darnay Holmes had a nice strip on a punt return that put us in, in big and nice position to score. And then uh, Bobby McCain is not, I mean, I don't know if Gunner, I mean, typically the punt return, Gunner in that situation who I can't believe he stayed in the game after he got rocked on that one play where the Packers player ran into him or he ran into the Packers player. He's got to be like spider, 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 or whatever your call is to tell people to like run to the sidelines and disperse, like get away from the punt returner because he's telling you that it's, uh, he can't get to it. So like skedaddle, you know, vamoose. I guess Bobby McCain didn't hear him or reacted too late and he, he touches the ball and he gives the Packers prime position at the Giants 14. So special teams still not great. You know, Randy Bullock missed a 48 yard field goal attempt. Uh, you know, I, I'm not too surprised by that. I, I, I don't like his odds. Uh, pretty much every time he goes on the field, I just don't like, I, I, I don't anticipate him making it, <laughs> you know, with Graham Gano, it was like 50 plus yard field goal. This is Mr. Automatic. 
put it on the board. Um, but with Randy Bullock, it's like, it's a flip of the coin, you know? And that's why, uh, even on that, the game winning field goal, I'm like, they're not close enough. <laughs> like even after Wandale Robinson makes that big catch DeVito with the absolute laser rope to Wandale Robinson along the sideline that he runs for, you know, into past the Packers 30, normally you'd be like game over. And I think even Joe Buck, the, you could hear in his voice, he thought the game wow. was over. And then I thought we we, we kind of just like phoned it in in terms of the the play calling and our execution on the next few plays where it's just hand off Saquon, hand off Saquon, hand off Saquon. You know, even on third down, I don't think third down was the time to do it, but I think like like second down, like after that first run where it's like he gets some po- he gets a little bit of positive yardage, two or three yards. We're now at the twenty something yard line, almost the twenty five. Like they're stacking the crap out of the box. Play action boot. If you don't have it, you can uh, uh, stay in bounds and fall the fall the ground. I just I, like I don't think they thought that we had the balls to throw a pass there. And like the the good teams can do that, where you're thinking run. Everyone in the building is thinking run because you want to run down the clock, and then you play action and throw it and complete it. Like that's what the the really great teams do. But you know, I think. Uh, ultimately it turned out fine but i mean i was like he's gonna miss this kick you know he's i mean i, I flash back to uh, i mean anytime i think of randy bullock it, it's him missing a big kick and sure enough they put up a graphic right before he makes the kick seven of 13 on game tying or game winning kicks in the fourth quarter or overtime seven of 13 he's it's literally a flip of the coin with this guy so I'm sitting there going, he's going to miss this. He missed a 48 yarder. He looks like he's shitting bricks on the sideline. You know, my mom's like, oh my God, the ball fell over <laughs> when he's setting it up on the tee and the ball falls over. It's like, oh, it just does. The optics aren't great. It doesn't look like he's, he's got all the confidence in the world. You know, um, he's not exactly, exactly like Lawrence Tynes sprinting onto the field despite Tom Coughlin's, you know, uh, screams to not do that. Um, and so I was like, I just, I just don't like this at all. And, uh, he made it. I'm not going to say he nailed it. Cause like if that kick was from like 44, I think he comes up short. <laughs> like he really did not put his all into that kick. He was so focused on just like, I'm going to take a nice, easy swing of the leg. I'm not going to drive this ball at all. I'm just going to make sure it goes straight up and straight because like there was not a ton of distance on that kick i didn't look like it it kind of just like it kind of just uh you know crawled its way over the crossbar <sighs> this was the first giants field goal as the clock hit all zeros in september of 2016 when josh brown hit a 23 yarder to give the giants a 16 3 16 13 win against the new orleans saints a game that i was at that was a friggin' cool game even though it was a low scoring you had a Victor Cruz touchdown. You had Janoris Jenkins return kick for a touchdown. Or maybe Cruz didn't score. He had a big gain down the right sideline of that. And then, uh, you know, I hate to bring up Josh Brown's name because I, I think he's done some bad stuff. But kind of fitting that we're going to play the New Orleans Saints next. Hmm? Kind of a good omen if such a thing exists. Good sign. I think the biggest part of this game, we came out of it with no injuries. When is the last friggin' time that you saw that happen? <laughs> So nice. No injuries. So yeah, that's the uh, Giants-Packers game.